Good morning. Good morning and welcome back to Control Systems 2. So as usual, we start with some uh, um, administrative uh, notes. We have started the first hardware exercises. How many of you have um, tried them out already? Okay. So how enthusiastic are you from one hands to two hands or no hands? Ah, good. Uh, that's good. One hand only. We'll have to talk about it. So we put a uh, uh, hardware, uh, yeah, um, a feedback form online. Please fill it up as usual. It helps us uh, make everything better. Uh, we noticed then that uh, not many of you have used the, the JMLJ44.4 lab, yeah, which is basically the same as the lab where you would be doing the assisted uh, hardware exercises, but uh, it's not assisted. That, is, that means it's, it's always open and it's there for you to use. It has everything you need to run the exercises. It has the computers on the same networks. It has ducky bots. It has a test, uh, um, a test loop. So you are free to go there whenever you want and uh, just play around with the system. Another important communication. It turns out that next uh, Monday is a spring festival. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a holiday I cannot pronounce, unfortunately. So uh, there will not be assisted office hours in the afternoon. Um, I don't think anybody of you signed up, but just for completeness, uh, we canceled them. And uh, the group uh, leaders will receive an email uh, sure, in the next days with uh, an alternative session organized so that you can catch up on the time. Finally, um, we opened the, the um, <coughs> subscriptions for TAs for Control System 1 next semester. So if you would like to give it a shot, please apply. And uh, we will do interviews in the next weeks. Any questions, comments, doubts? Yes, no, maybe? OK. So yeah, today we're going to do an experiment. I'm not going to use the Blackboard. I'm going to use this, this, this thing. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be clearer and nicer. Unfortunately, I won't be able to walk around, but let's see what happens. OK, so today we're going to talk about uh, robust performance. What's, how does it fit in the bigger picture? So you recall what's the story, right? We started at the very beginning picking off uh, what was left from Control Systems 1, and we introduced what are the objectives of a controller, right? So we always care about, uh, first and foremost, making a system stable, then guaranteeing performance in some way. Uh, performance is typically our uh, referred to uh, disturbance rejection or noise attenuation and the reference tracking. And uh, we saw um, shortly after what, what were the limitations that uh, stood in the, in, in the way for a controller to achieve these objectives. So we looked at some uh, theoretical, let's say fundamental limitations, uh, such as the complementarity of the uh, sensitivity functions or the um, existence of, uh, of uh, uh, right-hand plane uh, zeros or the Bode integral, now that you cannot just arbitrarily shape the sensitivity functions as you wish across all frequencies, but there are actually some, some fundamental constraints that there is little we can do about that impose some trade-offs between uh, the objectives that we just mentioned. Um, we then uh, looked at some uh, practical uh, limitations, as you might have noticed when playing around with the uh, DuckyBot, when you work with discrete time systems, think things are a little different. And um, so we then extended uh, a little, we, we went in a different axis and we started extending a little bit what is the, the, what are the systems that we can actually analyze and, and design controllers with. So we introduced multi-input, multi-output systems, and uh, we started identifying some, some peculiarities with respect to what we knew already of, of CISO systems. And we saw that uh, there are transfer matrices, that orders uh, of, of multiplications of matrices matter, and that there's this concept of directionality, so, uh, which, which of course has to do with the fact that there are multiple input channels and multiple output channels. So to investigate this concept, we started introducing some tools. We introduced, we introduced the norms that allow us to measure uh, sizes of, 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 of signals and systems. And then we looked at the singular value decomposition, which was a way to, to break down these transfer uh, matrices and understand what are the 
the maximum and minimum gains uh, in, the, in, in, in the system, uh, which were represented by the singular values. And, uh, and then we proceeded in analyzing some of the fundamentals of, of, uh, of MIMO systems in terms of the objectives we want to achieve from an analysis perspective. That is, can, how can we check if, 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 these, if robustness or stability uh, were actually guaranteed given a plant and a controller? And uh, uh, last uh, time we introduced uh, 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 the concept that we talked about robustness in the sense of, of uh, model uncertainty. We, I hope, agreed that uh, if there is one thing that really we, there is little we can do about, and a fundamental truth is that every time we use a model of a system that we base our controller upon, it's fundamentally wrong in the sense that the model only captures some behaviors of a system that, we, that, we, that, that might be of, of, of use to us, but eventually uh, there is always something missing. It could be a high-frequency behavior, it could be an unmodeled dynamics, uh, whatever it is there are a number of, uh, of parameterizations of uncertainty, uh, that, uh, of model uncertainty, that can be introduced. Uh, we focus only on a couple, which are the most common, the additive and the multiplicative one. And, um, and we saw which, and we, we, we sort of hand waved, we, we, we said, uh, look, if these uh, uh, uncertainties are present in a system and we still want to guarantee robust stability, that is, uh, we want the system to be stable for all the possible plants that fit within the, the, the nominal one and, and the set defined by the uncertainty, then there were some conditions. And of course, these conditions changed based on what um, kind of uncertainty parameterization we were using. So what we will... Um, so we saw in previous classes that uh, there was this, this tool, this, this very powerful tool called the small gain theorem that allowed us to do a simple um, uh, stability analysis. So we saw that for MIMO systems, there are, we have to you know, focus on two kinds of stability. There is the input-output stability, the external stability, uh, and there is the internal one. The internal one being uh, uh, the system has to be stable in the sense that every, every signal, every regulated signal inside the, the system, even the errors, the inputs, uh, they have to be bounded from uh, whatever, kind, whatever point in the loop you go and, and, and plug, uh, and plug external exogenous signals in, for example, disturbances, noises, or references, everything has to be bounded. It's, you can't just, just uh, focus on the input-output relationship. But anyways, we saw the small gate theorem, and we saw that this was very useful to provide sufficient conditions for, input, for external stability, input-output stability. Why? Because thanks to uh, the concept of system norms, we realized that, uh, uh, well, uh, regardless of the direction of the input, uh, uh, the, the maximum amplification that a system can bring was related to these gains of, of, of the system, which were these, these system norms. And we saw that uh, regardless of, of the signs of, of the feedback, if they're positive or negative, if we analyzed a closed loop, an interconnection of two of these systems, uh, it was sufficient to say that if the product of the two system gains is less than one, then the, signal, the system will be input-output stable because the, system will, the, the signals will eventually attenuate. Uh, and we said that this, uh, but if you look, so we remember now when we looked at CISO systems that we studied a lot these uh, stability, right? And we saw what, what are the margins for stability. So there was the gain margin, there was the phase margin that told, give us information about how much we could play around with the controller or, or tolerate uncertainty before things went unstable. Uh, here, if you notice, we're only looking at norms, right? We're only looking at gains. We're not looking at phases. Uh, all that information is neglected because of the fact that we're taking norms. Therefore, the results that are provided by this theorem are, are, are conservative. And uh, we then looked at internal stability, and, uh, and basically what we did was writing the input-output transfer functions between uh, some exogenous inputs and the uh, signals that go in the loop. And we noticed that we have these four matrices that come out and said, look, in order for the system to be internally stable, each and every one of these, in, of these components of, the, of these transfer functions must be, must be stable. Okay? So... Um, Thanks to this, we managed to look at, uh, we then moved on and looked at what does it mean to have performance. Now, and we introduced it just like performance, but to, from today we, we, will, we will have to uh, distinguish a little bit. And remember, this is nominal performance. So nominal in the sense that we're not considering any uncertainty. There is no model uncertainty coming into play. So this is... Uh, uh, these are the constraints on, on how to obtain a performance system in case that your model is perfect, like you're perfectly describing what, what's going on. And we saw there were similarities between uh, uh, CISO and MIMO systems. It's only that uh, in CISO systems, what we were considering were the absolute values of the uh, 
loop transfer function, well, we go to MIMO systems, this, 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 the role of the magnitude was taken by the maximum and the minimum singular values of the same function. And so we saw that uh, pretty much the conclusions were the same. Uh, we, would, we will have to have uh, at low frequencies where typically disturbances are, are more significant, uh, high loop gains and, and, and uh, vice versa at high frequencies where noises typically have higher frequency content. And um, so we, we noticed that these, these conditions were obtained how? Now, we, 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 we did what, what, what we focused a lot in this course was these sensitivity functions. Now, at the end of the day, this gang of six or the gang of four, depending if you include or not the uh, feed forward term, tell you everything there is to know about the relationships between the different signals in the system. So we just wrote down the transfer functions and we picked the ones that were uh, related were mapping between the inputs and outputs of interest and said, look, this transfer function has to have a gain that is less than one. So we used infinity norms. We said, look, all these conditions were obtained by, by putting bounds on infinity norms. And this is a concept that we'll come back today. We then introduced some uncertainty and we just threw it there and said, look, there is additive uncertainty and there's multiplicative uncertainty and a bunch of other uncertainties, but we focus on this. And if you consider your, um, your delta, that is your, your model uncertainty parameterization to be of unit norm, um, then, uh, then we had some conditions that were coming out. Uh, in particular, again, there were bounds on, the, on infinity norms. But we didn't really, really go into the detail of why that happened. So, Today, I would like to start with uh, um, deriving one of these conditions, and, uh, and that will help us have a little bit more of intuition, of understanding uh, of what is actually going on and what does it mean. So we'll look at a single input, single output case, because it's, more, um, it's easier, and, but the conclusions are similar. And then we'll introduce some, uh, 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 a trick, <laughs> something called the linear fractional transformations that are basically just a different way, it's a notation, to a different way to write systems. Instead of the typical block diagrams that we've seen a million times, uh, we are going to write them, we are going to use this, this uh, more generalized approach to, to, to write down systems, which is going to turn out to be particularly useful for robustness, but we'll talk about robustness analysis, but we'll talk about that later. So, um, let's say that we have, uh, so we're looking at robust stability now, so we're trying to, to understand a little bit more what does it mean if I have a nominal plant, we have a controller that stabilizes the nominal plant, so let's say uh, we call the, 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 the nominal plant P0 and we have a controller C and we say C is designed or ready to stabilize this nominal plant, but we introduce some parameterization of uncertainty, we say look, the real plant, the perturbed plant, is actually the thing you, we are going to practically control, is related to the nominal plant, plant in some way. Here we're using a parameterization of, um, of uh, multiplicative uncertainty. And, uh, and we introduced these, these weight functions, right? And uh, we didn't really explain what they mean, but, but the idea is uh, we impose constraints on the formulation of uncertainty such that our math becomes easier and we can do all the interpretations we want in a, in a neat way. The weight functions are there to uh, bridge the, the, the concessions we're doing to make our math easier to the actual reality. So if there are any uh, prior information you have about uncertainty, or like for example, it's only present at high frequencies or it has these amplitudes or whatever it is, uh, you, you, you can include them in, in, the, in the weighting function. You define the weighting function to be something that is a filter fundamentally. It's, it's different from zero in the frequency domain, only at the specific functions that, that you know that disturbance or in this case uncertainty comes in and you can modulate its magnitude. So these weighting functions are a way to bridge the simplifying assumptions that we make on the, on the uncertainty to what is the actual effect of, of this uncertainty in the system. So let's assume again that this controller stabilizes the plant. And if you remember good old uh, Nyquist theorem, um, we saw that, uh, suppose that we, 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 say, we write down the, the, the polar plot of the loop transfer function, and we see that it's a stable if uh, this uh, uh, quantity, which is uh, uh, represented by the distance from the, any point of, 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 the, of the plot to the critical point minus one, has to be bigger than zero. And that's for the nominal system. Now, so what happens when we actually introduce the perturbed plant inside? So here it's just an exercise of substitution. We look at what is one plus L uh, with the real plant. So we substitute P that comes from here. And uh, 
we do the pass to JSON, what we see is that we get a term that is related always to the, to the um, nominal part of the plant. And then there is a contribution that comes from the uncertainty. And if we want to uh, find what is the condition that would make the perturbed system uh, stable, we see that we have to find what's the magnitude of 1 plus L, which is the magnitude of this part here. And if we use the triangle inequality, uh, we can divide this into terms and say the, it's, uh, the, 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 the 1 plus L is bigger than the nominal part minus this uh, other term. And uh, consider here that uh, P0C is, of course, the uh, nominal uh, open loop, uh, the loop function. And, uh, and we can bound this again by, by just uh, taking advantage of the hypothesis we made at the beginning that the magnitude of the delta is uh, smaller or equal than one at every frequency. And we get to this, to, to this expression here, that it's uh, similar, of course, to the one we had before, but it factors in the knowledge we have of perturbance uh, thanks to this weighting function. So what, what does this say? It says that um, instead of just the distance between this point, the critical point, and any, 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 any uh, point on the loop has to be bigger than zero, actually you can imagine L not uh, W being uh, um, a, a ball expanding at any point of this loop. And what the stability condition says is, look, it's not just the nominal plot that doesn't have to intersect the critical point, but anything that is within this circle of uncertainty does not have to intersect the uh, stability point. So basically what we're saying is that uh, the difference between these two uh, vectors has to be bigger than zero. And in fact, if you look at this, this is for CISO systems, uh, you might recognize that it's pretty much the same condition we got for, for, for MIMO systems, right? So this is the weighting function. We're using only one here, but in the, in the MIMO system we use the two. And then there's the uh, complementary sensitivity function here. And of course, uh, instead of just using the magnitude uh, in the MIMO system, we use the, infinite, the system norm, the infinity norm, because it's a more appropriate measure. So the question of robust stability in general is that of uh, um, if we have an internally stabilized system and uh, some model uncertainty, what are the conditions uh, that, uh, uh, for which we can uh, guarantee uh, stability for all the possible plants that are, are mapped in this, in, in this uh, uncertainty? And a good way to, uh, to, to analyze this problem and all the related ones is to use this, this linear fractional transform that is basically a way to decouple uh, the nominal part of the process from the uncertainty itself. So uh, what we do is we just uh, write out uh, the nominal part of the plant, and, uh, uh, which receives a number of generalized inputs and produces uh, some generalized, generalized outputs. And typically the generalized inputs, uh, W, are everything that comes from outside. Okay, So it could be a disturbance, a noise, uh, or even a reference signal. Well, the output of the system is everything you care about, everything you want to regulate, you want to control. For example, the output, for example, the errors or the input, and these kind of things. And then we just uh, uh, pull out the uncertainty, and uh, we define whatever goes inside the uncertainty block as an input to the uncertainty block, and whatever goes out as an output of the uncertainty block. You might think, why is this relevant? How can it be useful? And we'll see it soon. So. At this point, we can write the transfer function between uh, the outputs and the inputs of the nominal plant, and, uh, and uh, we just uh, partition this, trans uh, this transfer matrix as four blocks, and we just give arbitrarily names to it. But we are supposing that uh, the, we are given an internally stabilized system, okay? So if it's internally stable, as we've seen before, this means that each one of these transfer functions is a stable, okay? And, uh, and so how is this useful to us? Well, we have uh, seen that, uh, so what is it that we, we, we can notice here? Um, first of all, we can notice that uh, uh, what, we want to, uh, it, the, what we want to study uh, when we look at stability is, of course, the relationship between the exogenous inputs and the regulated outputs in the system. So the, the, the transfer function between the Ws and the Zs. So this, this G, Z, W. And uh, if we just uh, use these notations before, we can do the math and see that uh, uh, G, Z, W can be represented as, uh, um, as uh, J delta I minus M delta inverse uh, and the transfer function here. The thing is that uh, 
we know that each one of these, of these transfer functions is independently stable. So when we ask the question, so for, for suppose that we have any possible delta that we admit in our family, no? what are the conditions on these, on these partitions part of the transfer function such that the overall thing is stable? And uh, if we look at it, actually, the only part that could pause, a so, so the only part that could cause a problem is this, is this inverse part here. And, uh, and basically this because when you do the inverse of a matrix, you have one over the determinant of this, no? And we want to make sure that the denominator is, uh, is, is different from zero in order to prevent stability, to, to, to guarantee stability. So um, this is gonna be the, the basis of, 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 uh, of the theorem we'll, we'll see soon. But let's just observe that M, so the stability, this robust stability, if we formulate it in this way, um, basically allows us to, to study the problem uh, of robust stability by considering the families of deltas and only the M submatrix. And the M submatrix is uh, the relationship between, uh, is the transfer uh, matrix between uh, the outputs and the inputs of the, of the uncertainty block. So we see that thanks to this way of writing it, we can isolate what is the effect of the, of the assumptions we're making on the perturbation on the actual nominal system. And uh, we will see that, uh, um, so, so we, we can see that this M basically is the relationship between the, the, the pieces of uncertainty, it's the uncertainty transfer function if we want. So what do we do now? Well, we, we, we know that the small gain theorem, which we just looked at, is a powerful tool. And, uh, and uh, so we apply it to this new notations that we've been using. And uh, we just uh, make the usual assumptions. We introduce a set of uncertainties. We say, okay, let's say that the set of uncertainties, all the possible uncertainties that satisfy the usual condition that the uh, infinity norm of the, of the delta has to be smaller or equal than one. And we let M be stable because we made the assumption of internal stability to start from. Then we can prove that uh, these, uh, these uh, the troublesome transfer uh, uh, pieces of the transfer function between the, the inputs and outputs of the system are stable if and only if the M, the infinity norm of the M subfunction of only the transfer function that is related to the uncertainty parts is a smaller than one. And uh, why is this useful? It's useful because now we can uh, treat many different cases in, uh, in just one different, uh, one different, one different framework. We can, it, it, it doesn't matter what kind of assumptions we make on the delta, as long as it, it, it satisfies uh, this uh, infinity norm, then we can uh, provide not only sufficient, as in the case of the small gain theorem, but sufficient and necessary conditions for robust stability. And uh, how do we have, I think this is worth uh, looking at a little bit more in detail. And we're gonna see, okay, so let's first prove the sufficiency. So the sufficiency, what does it mean? It means that we have to show that uh, uh, this, 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 this transfer matrix has, uh, is, is, is invertible, so it has no zeros in the right-hand plane. And also invertibility, so the fact that, that the system is stable, is given if and only if uh, this condition is verified. What does this mean? You remember that for a zero, we had the, the, the fact that, uh, let's say we have a transfer function, P of S, and it has a zero at Z, then if we uh, insert an input, this goes to zero, right? So if we, in this case, we are, we are calling X the, the input or the, 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 the signal we're multiplying by this uh, transfer function here, and uh, to say there are no zeros, what we're saying is, uh, if the size of the output of this signal y that comes out by passing mu towards, uh, uh, through, through the transfer matrix is bigger than zero, for any x, of course, that is different from zero, and for all deltas that are allowed by, by our formulation, then we're good. And uh, if we just uh, first use the triangle inequality, again, we can isolate the two components. Of course, this is the first one, and then uh, And then the second one is x and this part here. It comes that it's the norm of x, the two norm of x minus the two norm of this other product here. Okay, so straightforward. Uh, we can use the definitions of induced matrix norms and just bound the, 
we can just bound the, the um, this uh, this uh, the, the norm of the output signal. I don't know if you remember the definitions of induced matrix norms. Was what is the maximum gain that a that a that a matrix can produce if you just send an input in any possible direction? And it turned out that it was bounded by the minimum and the maximum uh, singular values of the system. We, we we remember that the singular values of the system represent the minimum maximum gains. So. Uh, this can be bounded is of course a smaller smaller than the biggest possible structure uh, singular value of this matrix times the the norm of the input and uh, thanks to the maximum modulus theorem which is a, a theorem that you might have studied in uh, in uh, uh, previous math classes we can say that so this theorem basically says that if you have uh, uh, some right-hand plane zeros, well, the, 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 the function will still be biggest when you are on the axis of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the complex plane. So basically, this is the, the control systems, let's say, uh, reformulation of the maximum modulus theorem. Uh, and uh, so it allows us basically to say that the maximum possible value of these function, of this singular value, is going to be defined on the j omega axis. Uh, so this can be uh, bounded again by the infinity norms because the infinity norms are the, by definition, the maximum value along all frequencies of a singular value. And, uh, and we can see that. So when, when, when is this bigger than zero? It's bigger than zero. Well, we know that the infinity norm of delta was, uh, um, was smaller than one by definition. So this goes, this, this, this is not a problem. So here we have x, the norm of x minus the norm of x. So the only way for this to be bigger than zero is that this whole term here is smaller than one. So we've got this second part that is smaller or equal than one. And so what's the condition such that we guarantee that this, uh, uh, this uh, transfer matrix is invertible? Well, we have to impose that the infinity norm of m is less than one, which is exactly the condition of the theorem. So um, this proves the sufficiency, but if we want to prove instead the other direction, necessity, what we do is say, okay, let's uh, construct a transfer function such that, uh, let's tra construct the M transfer function such that at a specific frequency, it has the maximum singular value, this gain that is bigger than one. Okay, so we are, we are negating the, the assumptions of the theorem. And how do we do that? Well, we just write it down. We remember the singular value decomposition. So we define it as if it was already uh, uh, um, broken down in, in a singular value decomposition. And basically what we say is like, is uh, m j omega zero is equal to whatever are their, their, their unit vectors and the, with, with, with the singular values across different directions. And what we do is we just define the first one to be bigger than one so that there exists a direction where this gain is bigger than one. And uh, well, then we have to define a delta, but a delta has to have an infinity norm that is less than one. So well, we can just pick it to be exactly the same thing as, I mean, we can use the same uh, input and output uh, uh, vectors of m, but we just pick one singular value and we define it as the inverse of the, of the sigma one we defined it before. Why? Because if sigma one is bigger than zero, then sigma one inverse is definitely small, sorry, is bigger than one. The other one is definitely smaller than one, and therefore the infinity norm of, remember that um, the infinity norm of something is uh, the, the biggest value across uh, all, possible, uh, all possible frequencies of the uh, induced to norm of a system, which is basically the maximum singular value of it. So if this is smaller than one, we're saying the infinity norm is smaller than one. And uh, so, well, how does this help us? Then we, we proceed by just constructing the matrix we want to prove that it's, that, that is invertible. So we just do the math, and here we take advantage of the, of the unitary relationship between the, the um, directions of the singular vectors, and we're simply multiplying this by this. We get uh, I minus, minus uh, the, uh, of course, sigma one by sigma one members gives one, and all the rest are zeros, so we do the difference. And what, ter what, what, what are we showing here? We're showing that there is a full uh, column of zeros. So if a matrix has a full column of zeros, there's no way you can invert it. And therefore, uh, we have proven that, uh, this, that, that, that it's not possible to have a stability of this I minus M delta if the maximum singular value, that is the infinity norm of M, is bigger than one. So it's, we proved by contradiction what we wanted to do. So, okay, all good and dandy. What, what, what are we saying here? We're saying, uh, look, there's this robust stability problem. There are many different deltas that we can bring in, right? But uh, how can, we can't just go and 
try them one by one and then find con specific conditions for each one of the different cases, even because we, we, we looked last time and we said this, this robustness, uh, these, these, how do you call them, these uh, perturbation sets um, don't necessarily need to have a physical meaning. We, we define them mathematically such that they will well represent whatever system we have at hand. So what we have done until now is just finding a formulation in which we can treat all these cases in the same way by, by, by using a single condition. So it's a way to, to make our life easier. But this is a, is, a, is a formulation that we need to derive from what we're given. We're always given the good old uh, block diagram with our PRC and all of that, right? So how do you pull out? This is a process that is usually sometimes referred to as pulling out the deltas. How do you pull out the delta and pass from a block diagram to, to, a, to an actual um, uh, for linear, transfer, linear uh, fractional transformation um, representation. So what we do is we just we define the inputs and the outputs systematically. Let's suppose we have Q of these deltas, a bunch of different uncertainties. We just define, as we did before, the inputs to the uncertainties are used as U of deltas, the outputs as Y of deltas. And then uh, uh, we saw that the M matrix, which is all that matters in this case, is the transfer function between the uncertainties. So we just defined the M matrix to be a partition matrix of, 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 of the right sizes. And uh, since this is, is since M is uh, the relationship between uh, uh, U and uh, Y, so let's suppose we just have two Ys, Y delta one and Y delta two, and we have U delta one and U delta two, then uh, the way we defined it, it's such that U delta one is equal M one one times y delta 1, and uh, the second index has to match the y. So each term of the m function is simply obtained by writing, as we always did, as we the same exact process as we did to find all the sensitivity functions. We write the transfer functions between the is uh, perturbation input and the js perturbation output. Uh, the only tricky thing that needs to be noticed here is that uh, Typically, you see that a transfer function, this has nothing to do with this, typically a P or whatever P, P transfer function is typically the ratio between the Y's and the U's. It's, uh, it's a map between the inputs and the outputs. If, and we typically use as a notation U for the inputs and Y for the outputs. So you get that Y is P of S times U, right? And, uh, but for how we introduce the notations in this linear fractional transform, this, this is not a typo. This is right. It's, it has to be, uh, M is actually the mapping between the outputs of the deltas to the inputs of the deltas. Why is that? It's because we're not checking the transfer function between uh, uh, U's and, 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 and Y's, uh, U deltas and Y deltas. That's the, that's the delta transfer function. What we're checking for is we're not looking for this transfer function. We're looking what is the effect that this transfer function has on the nominal system. That's, that's, that's why this is uh, slightly different. So just be careful not to mess up the, 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 um, the notation here. So once we, we have this tool, this is a, a standardized process. Uh, we can then write the uh, diagonal matrix, the delta matrix as a diagonal matrix. And so let's do it, not because it's easier to say, but uh, so how, how, how do we get this done? Well, uh, let's take an example. This is an example of additive uncertainty, okay? So we have our typical block, so, but what's the difference? Instead of having the nominal plant in here, we have to put the, the, the perturbed plant, the set pi, big pi, we called it before, no? And uh, in this case, pi is such that we're using additive uncertainty, so we're saying uh, uh, the, the, the deltas are basically the nominal plant plus this. But, was there a question? So how do we pull out the deltas? How do we get to, to, to find this M transfer function that makes our life so much easier? Well, we looked at, so what happens if I have a transfer function pi of s and we just send an input inside? Uh, well, the output, it's gonna be p0 times u plus this whole mass times u, right? It's easy peasy. So we just need to rewrite the block diagram such that on the other side of pi here, we actually get eta, okay? So how do we do that? Well, we explode the pi into this block diagram. Why? Because that's what makes the math turn out. So if you now look at the signal eta, eta is equal to what? It's equal to this P0U plus this component here, which is exactly what we need. Okay, so in this way, we just represent, we just explicitated the, 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 the assumption we made on the delta set and we represented it graphically. At this point, we name, we label, 
the inputs and outputs of the delta blocks as u deltas and y deltas according to the procedure. And how do we have and how do we find the dm transfer function? Well, each one of the term we know that the m transfer function is going to be a diagonal transfer function with the, each term of the principal diagonal being the trans sorry, uh, it's going to be a, not a diagonal transfer function. M is going to be a transfer function where each component is the mapping between the ith and jth uh, inputs and outputs of the delta blocks. So what do we need to find? In this case, of course, we've got only one delta block. So what we need to find is u delta 1 divided by y delta 1. How do you do that? Well, you always start from what you want to find, OK? So you write down u delta. And what is u delta? u delta is the uh, u times w2, right? So it's this relationship here. Then if we go and look at the u, we just write what we're good at. We did this a thousand times. Are there questions? No? Make sense? Till now? OK. So we just write the u, and we see, well, what's u? Now u is the, is the signal e passing through c, but e is the difference between the r and y. And we proceed and we do this. Uh, at this point, remember, we're just looking at the, we, we're looking to identify the relationships between the u's and the deltas. We, so we don't really, we can assume that r is equal to zero if you want, that n is equal to zero. We don't really care about that part for now. We're just looking at the transfer function between the u's and, 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 and y's of delta. So we do the math, and what comes out is that this is the relationship between u and y delta. We take this, we put it back in here, and we get that u delta and y delta are related by this, these, this, transfer, this, this, this transfer function. We call this m of s because it's the mapping between the inputs and outputs of the uncertainty blocks. And what do we do? We apply the small gain theorem, the unstructured small gain theorem that we just looked, we, because we saw that if the deltas are, uh, have an infinity norm that is less than one, and this is an assumption of how we define the, the additive uncertainty set, then the whole system is going to be robustly stable if and only if the infinity norm of m is smaller than one. So we adjust apply the infinity norm to this thing here. And what do we get? We get W2 CS0 omega 1, the infinity norm is less than one, which is exactly what we have said last time. If you remember, I should avoid doing this, I'm sorry, but it's exactly this condition here, which is the robust stability condition. So, very well. So what, uh, are there any questions about this? This is an example of how to pull out the deltas, which is a process that can be uh, useful and it's different in every case, of course, depending on the assumptions you make on your delta set, but the approach to, to, to obtaining this M function, which is fundamental, is always the same. You have to pull out the blocks, define the inputs and outputs with this way, and then just, just, just find the transfer function by mapping the signals in the system. So we could do it again for the multiplicative uncertainty. I'll leave this for you on, uh, 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 as an exercise, maybe on Tuesday. And you'll see that you'll derive exactly the conditions for, for, the, other, for the other case. So now there is an important step, very, very important. Why, why do we care about introducing this, this linear fractional transform uh, uh, approach? Well. It's, uh, it's definitely cool because, as we said, it allows us to consider all things at once. But, but look at this. So we uh, have seen and just uh, shown again that uh, when you want to find conditions for robust stability, it turns out that you have to do, uh, the, the, the condition is a bound on the infinity norm of some transfer function, of the M transfer function, right? So it's the, I guess the key word is bounding the infinity norm. And what does it mean? It means that uh, you're, you're making sure that in the worst case the scenario that is for the most uncertain, that the, the plant that is m uh, most distant from your nominal plant is still guarantees a stability. So infinity norms is always associate worst case scenario to it, okay? And uh, if you remember, last lecture when we derived the conditions for performance, for nominal performance, no? okay? So the ones we saw uh, it before, those were bounds on the infinity norms as well. So something going on in the sense that we can, uh, uh, let's suppose we just look at uh, a performance problem, a nominal performance problem, okay? And uh, let's suppose we say, look, we want to, to do a noise attenuation problem. We want our system to be, to be very insensitive to, to noise, to measurement noise. So what do we do? We, guess what? First, make an assumption and say, hey, let's make sure that we write down the noise input to the signal such that its size is less than one. Why? Well, well, it's 
Remember before we did the uh, assumptions on the delta being less than one because it made our, our, our life easier. But then of course noise that goes in a system, it's not that nature really cares about our assumptions. So how do we represent the actual noise that goes in the system? Well, just put in a weighting function and let's call it the noise weighting function, which is something that just maps between the simplifying mathematical assumptions we've made for the, on the normal band to the actual real noise that gets into our system. And uh, we say, okay, we care about having uh, a nominal performance, that is, we, let's do exactly the same passages as we did last time. And if we write the, the relationship between the input and the output, we, sorry, the, the, the output of the system and the noise, we want small effect of noise on the output, so we write the transfer function, and it turns out to be this one here. And what do we do? We say, yeah, the infinity norm has to be less than one. Okay, this is what we've done last time. Easy peasy. Now, just note that if you wrap up the, the, uh, this uh, uh, noise that comes into a system and you add a completely fictitious uh, perturbation block, let's call it the delta P, it's, it's a, a performance delta, and you just wrap it up in this way, the math comes out to be exactly the same. That is, if you find the transfer function between Y and N, it still is the, the, the same as before. And if we apply the unstructured uh, small gain theorem that we just introduced and we say, okay, robust stability happens if this M transfer function, so the method we just talked about, this M transfer function has infinity norm less than one, well, we have to simply do, this is the M transfer function. We say if this has to have infinity norm less than one, well, it's exactly the same condition that we would obtain from nominal performance. So what's the, the, the catch? It turns out that... Uh, we can always recast a nominal performance problem into a robust stability one just by playing around with the notations and introducing these fictitious delta blocks. So this is a nominal performance and this is a robust stability problem. But now we know we have this very powerful tool we introduced for robust stability of the, of the LFT approach and the M delta structure. So if all the nominal performance problems can now be recast in robust stability problems, things are easy because are easy, are interesting, let's say, not easy, because we have a common framework to address both of these, of these arenas. So in summary for this first uh, part of the class, uh, first it's important to say the, that the, the LFTs uh, is just a way to represent systems. It doesn't uh, introduce any new concept if not just writing things in a different way. And all it does is it isolates the nominal part of the system with its inputs and outputs that are the exogenous signals and the regulated variables, and it pulls out the delta. Why? So that we can study the effect of the perturbation assumptions on the nominal system, because we care always about finding condition on our nominal system. Why? Because the nominal system is what are the things you know. You have, a, you know the, the, nom, the model of your plant. You don't know the real plant, right? That's the whole point for which we're introducing uncertainty. And um, so in this way, we can study the effect of, of perturbations on the systems. Let me just put a very short note here that we didn't talk about, but LFTs are not just about this. LFTs uh, are typically used in a more, even more generalized way by, by isolating even the, the controller part. But we will not talk about this. But just don't get worried if when you look at uh, your textbooks you see that sometimes they isolate both the delta and the K. It's, it can be done. So LFTs are just a way to pull out what is of interest to you from a system. In this case, for robustness analysis, we care about the effect of perturbations, so that's what we pull out. Then. We can apply this uh, small gain theorem to this new structure, and, uh, and uh, what we get is, uh, is a common framework to do robust stability analysis. Then uh, the other next important part we talked about is that uh, um, all nominal performance problems, that we showed only one, but you test it for yourself, you can, you'll see that any nominal, perf nominal performance problem can be rewritten as a robust stability problem, and this is good because now we always use the same uh, condition. But what's the catch? The catch, and this is very important because it's what's going to happen in the next hour, is that, as we said at the very beginning, the small gain theorem doesn't take into account phase. It's very conservative, okay? So, especially when we're studying robustness, you're designing a controller such that you want it to be uh, stable under uncertainty. Of course, it's good to be safe. You don't want things to blow up. But if you are dealing with, a, with, a, with, a, with an application that requires performance, 
well, uh, you don't want to be too conservative because, of course, this being conservative on stability comes at a cost. Now there is a trade-off with performance. So, um, and so this brings us to exactly the next and last step of the analysis uh, part of this course, which is, uh, what is what about robust performance? We talked about uh, stability. We talked about not. We, so, so now let's relabel stability as nominal stability. We talked about nominal performance. Then we talked about robust stability, robustness being when we introduce model uncertainty. What about robust performance? So, and this is going to be something we'll talk about once you come back from the break. Any questions? No? Enjoy. Okay, find a seat. You've got a long way to go. Sit down. Okay, so, so, so. Uh, uh, uh. I'm going to take a minute back at the end of the class, huh? Okay, so, ready or not, I'm starting. Um, what is the argument of the next, uh, next module, the next hour? We're going to talk about robust performance, as we uh, said before. We have been studying uh, uh, systematically every aspect of uh, nominal stability, nominal performance, and then we introduced uncertainty that created the problem of robustness. And, uh, of course, robustness, once you have uncertainty, it's appropriate to rediscuss both stability and performance. So we just discussed the stability. Let's look at robust performance. So why, why, why is it relevant to talk about this? Well, because uh, when you introduce the stability, for sure it's important that your system doesn't blow up, that it's still stable, because you're designing a controller for a plant that is not actually the real one, so it's legitimate to wonder, but does it actually work? But what often happens is that when you have uh, um, uh, uncertainty, the performances of your system become unacceptable way before it goes unstable. I mean, stability means that uh, probably you won't end up in jail, but uh, bad performance still means that the design is wrong and should be redone. So the question is, how do we uh, test for robust performance? That is, how can we uh, guarantee that uh, given uncertainty, we're still uh, verifying the good criteria for noise rejection, disturbance uh, uh, attenuation, or reference tracking, right? So I'm not sure I have ever done this before, so let's just uh, uh, write things, spell things out uh, for once. What are the four things that we're talking about? Nominal stability. You have What's the problem of nominal stability? Design a controller that internally stabilizes a nominal plant. Okay, so you've got your controller, you've got your nominal plant, P0. C stabilizes and in, internally stabilizes P0. Okay, what's robust stability? Robust stability is uh, the same thing basically, but this time with a non-nominal public perturbed plant. So C and we'll use pi as to say all the family of all the possible perturbed plants. What's nominal performance? Nominal performance is, again, given a nominal plant and a controller that stabilizes it. Uh, what, uh, how, what kind of extra constraints do we have to introduce to guarantee some, some, some good fe desirable features, like noise, disturbance, and tracking? And now we get to robust performance. What is robust performance? It's like robust, like nominal performance, just that we all have to discuss this with all possible families of plans and not just the nominal one. So let's make an example problem definition. So this whole thing is going to, this whole next uh, hour is going to be gravitating around one specific uh, example, so to speak, which is the, uh, that of, um, um, in this case, we're going to look at noise attenuation and, uh, and multiplicative uncertainty. But let's formulate the problem in general. So what is the problem of robust performance? Is giving a nominal plant and some modern uh, model uncertainty parameterization, we want to find that the conditions on the nominal closed-loop system, so P0C, such that 
we have uh, uh, robust stability and uh, such that some performance metric is satisfied for all possible plants in the uncertainty set. So basically, it's exactly like we did before. Uh, I could go a few slides back and see, you see, this was the, the noise attenuation on the output problem. Uh, we saw that the, if we just write down the relationships as we typically do, this was the transfer matrix between the noise and the Y, and it turned out that there was this um, bound on the infinity norm of the, of the sensitivity function. And uh, so if we are looking at nominal performance, we get this. And if we are studying the problem of robust performance, what, what changes? The only thing that changes is that we're not considering P, but we're considering all the possible family of plants. So the question of this next hour is, what are the, con the conditions on the nominal plant such that we guarantee robust performance? And that's what we're going to look at now. So let's use the trick we just saw at the last, uh, uh, last few slides of the previous hour. We saw that any nominal, nominal performance problem can be recast as a robust stability problem. Right? Does it make sense for everybody? Is this clear? Yes, no, maybe? Fox clamantis in deserto. Okay. And uh, we saw that uh, if we were, when we studied the robust stability problem alone, we can use this generalized framework of pulling out the deltas, and we have this nice, simple uh, condition that the infinity norm of the mth transfer function has to be smaller than one. So we got a powerful now framework to analyze robust stability. And we ask ourselves, well, what is the robust performance problem? It's exactly the nominal performance problem, but we are inserting, we're, we are inserting now the, ins the, the uncertainty of the plant. So if this was a uh, nominal performance problem that was rewritten as a robust stability problem by introducing this fictitious performance perturbation delta P. And uh, the robust stability problem alone can be seen as uh, substituting the plant with the actual perturbed plant. By the way, you'll see that this block diagram is slightly different from the previous one because we're making different assumptions on the delta set, but we, you, you can notice that on your own later. The robust performance problem is nothing but considering the two things together. So the nominal performance problem, we're wrapping the uh, noise back into the plant, so we are recasting a nominal performance problem as a robust stability one. This is the nominal performance part. And then we have the robust stability part. So this is exactly a nominal perfor uh, robust performance problem. It's what are the mutual interactions between uh, uh, the desire for performance, but in presence of uncertainty. And since we are just putting them together, it's maybe legitimate to ask ourselves, if we have conditions for nominal performance and we have conditions for robust stability. Is uh, robust performance, so I'll just write it like this, although it's not real math, is it just uh, robust stability plus nominal performance? And it's a question. In the sense, suppose that I satisfy the conditions for nominal performance and the condition for robust stability. Does that already guarantee robust uh, performance? Let's figure it out. So. How are we going to proceed here to, to figure this out? Well, we just uh, introduced the LFT problem exactly for this. So you can see that now we have this big block diagram, which is nothing but a robust stability problem with two delta, uh, two uncertainties. So which are the robustness part and the delta P part. Please note that uh, uh, I relabeled, I think, some, some terms just to, to make the notation consistent. but. So how do we obtain this? Uh, how, how do we proceed from here? Well, we have now the, uh, the block diagram that we want to analyze. We have pulled out the deltas in the sense that we have represented the block diagram uh, explicitating the two perturbations blocks. 
we all apply the recipe that we, that we introduced before. So we label the inputs and outputs of each delta block as uh, u and y delta i, whatever i is, 1 and 2 in this case. Remember that we have an assumption here that the individually the infinity norms of each perturbation block has to be smaller than 1, but we have introduced these weighting functions, omega w1, w2, and wn, to actually compensate for the difference. And we need to find the M matrix. So I think it might be useful to just sketch out how to do it. I just hope I have enough space here. Let's try this out. So how do we do this? Well, what we need to find is uh, u delta 1 equals something and u delta 2 equals something because uh, what we're looking for are the four terms of the M transfer function, which are going to be the different transfer matrices between the ith and jth inputs and outputs of the delta function. So, as we did before, what is u of delta 1? u of delta 1 is w2 times u, right? Because u comes out from here, so this is w2 times u. What is u delta 2? u delta 2 is just y, okay? So, well, this tells us automatically how to proceed because now we need to figure out what's u and what's y. So what is u? u, let's go and check it out. u is this one. And what is it? Is P naught times whatever signal comes in here, that is uh, E times this. So this is P naught C times E, okay? So I might have convinced you before or not, I don't know, that uh, when we are looking for the M transfer function, we can just consider R's and D's and N's a zero because it's just a pain to rewrite them down all the time. So I'll just assume that R is equal to zero here. And uh, so what is uh, this u becomes p naught times c times e. e would be r minus y. I don't want to write the y, the r, so it's minus y. Okay? And what's y, though, at this point? Well, y is here, right? y is equal to this signal here. Let's call it y1 plus this signal here. Let's call it y2. So y1 is uh, omega n times y delta 2, right? And w y2 is equal to what? Is equal to u plus this signal here. Plus uh, this signal here, which is w1 y delta 1. Okay? So just to, to, to clean things up a little bit, I'll just move over here to continue the passages. What we do is we take the y and we plug it in here. And we get that u is equal to p naught c minus p naught c times y, which is this whole thing, omega n y delta 2 plus omega w1 y delta 1. And the u part we're bringing out directly is minus p naught c u. Please let me know if I'm doing mistakes with the passages. So what are we going to do here? We're going to take this term here, bring it to the other side right, uh, um, how do you say, right, gather, uh, right, well, I'll show you. You get uh, P naught C U plus U is equal to pi minus P naught C omega N Y delta 2 minus P naught C W1 Y delta 1. So here you just take U from the right side and you get the same thing. This follows that u is equal to i plus p naught c inverse times p naught c. What is that? Out of the box? No? So this is minus i plus p zero c inverse p naught c wn y delta 2 plus minus same thing here. Okay, so... Let's use some colors. This guy here is the complementary sensitivity function at the output, which is the same thing here. Okay. So, so what? Now that we have uh, U, we can uh, write this in here. And what do we get is that U delta 1 is equal to the minus W2, T naught 
times Wn y delta 2 plus minus W2 T naught omega 1 y delta 1, W1. So, I mean, the, the process, I guess, it's clear by now. And this, so where are the M transfer functions? With This is y delta 1, this is u delta 1. So uh, M11 would be the ratio of uh, u to y. And it's this. So this is M11. Well, this term here is M12. So this is exactly what we wrote down here. And if you do it for the other term as well, you'll get the uh, secondary components that you see written here. Now, some observations. If you notice, the terms that are on the main diagonal, the first one and the, the 1, 1, and 2, 2 components, are exactly the transfer uh, matrices in this case that uh, we bound as a conditions for robust stability and nominal performance. Remember, we're studying the problem of robust performance, and we do it by putting together nominal performance and robust stability. And guess what? The M transfer function represents exactly the two conditions that we know work for each one of these two problems independently in this way. And the diagonal terms instead are some terms that represent the interaction of these, of these phenomena brought together. So, well, now we have an M matrix. We introduced the unstructured, the small game theorem before because uh, it was useful. So it turns out that this problem is, uh, this, this plant is a stable, that is the, the nominal, the robust performance problem is satisfied if the infinity norm of this plant is less than one. So, so okay, this, this, are there any questions about this? Any doubts? Yes, no, no. Um, let's observe a few things. Um, what we just did is perfectly fine, of course, right? It's, it's, it's a valid approach. But we, have, we are just considering what? We're considering the sizes of our perturbations here, OK? When you consider the size of something or the maximum gains, uh, that's good. But it's as if you're just considering the absolute value of a, of a, of a, of a single input, single output uh, problem transfer function, but you're not considering the phase, OK? So you're missing out on some information. In this case, the information we're missing out on that we're not even considering in this approach is the structure of delta. If when we study a robust performance problem and we pull out the deltas in this approach that we've shown, it always turns out that the delta function is a diagonal block. Uh, if it's a MIMA problem, it's a, a, a it's, um, diagonal matrix with blocks on each terms of the main diagonal. If it's a CISA problem, it's just a diagonal matrix. But it's diagonal. It has a very well-defined structure. The theorem we've introduced until now completely neglect the concept of structure. And as a result, we obtain very, very conservative uh, um, conditions. So this led to the introduction of a new measure, a new uh, tool that is called the structured singular value, or MU, which uh, provides tighter, tighter bounds to the problem of robust stability and, and, of course, robust performance in this case. So what is MU? Mu is a nasty thing, okay? So bear with me. So let's look at the intuition uh, first. What it is, it's, it's a generalization of the concept of, uh, of uh, uh, structured singular value and, uh, and that of uh, spectral radius. Uh, the sp Sorry a sec, this is falling. The spectral radius is, um, is the maximum eigenvalue of something, right? Of a, of a matrix. So how do we define it? Let's just look at the, um, at the mathematical definition first, this thing here. So what's mu of m, uh, the structured singular value of mu? Sometimes it's even written as mu delta of m, because guess what? It's the, exact, the reason for which it was introduced is that we are now considering delta inside the definition of the singular value of the plant m. So what is it? It's the inverse, so 1 over, forget about that for now, that's the least of our problem, of 
the inf, the infimum, which is the greatest lower bound, so you can imagine it as if it was a min. So it's the inverse of the minimum possible what? The minimum possible maximum sigma <laughs> structured value of, of delta, such that, wait, wait, wait well, this is going to be clearer in a while, such that the determinant of i minus m delta is equal to zero. So what does this mean? What happens if uh, the determinant of i minus m delta is equal to zero? We showed before, we did the proof, now we want to show that this is invertible, it has to, the determinant has to be different from zero. So if it's equal to zero, what does it mean? Try it, come on. No, you're, you're only on TV, don't worry about what you're saying. <laughs> no? So if that determinant is equal to zero, okay, let's go and check it out though, because otherwise it's pointless. So, 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 um, I think it was here, yes, so. This is the, the, we just introduced linear fractional transformations, right? And we saw that the whole system in presence of perturbance is stable if this transfer matrix GZW is stable. Why, when is it stable? If I minus M delta is invertible. If there exists the inverse of I minus M delta. When does it exist? When the determinant is different from zero. So when we say the determinant of uh, uh, I minus M delta, where is it here? is equal to zero, what we're saying is uh, the system is going unstable, okay? So, step back a second. What does mu of m tell us? It tells us, find the maximum singular value of delta. What does it mean? It's the size, the size of delta, the maximum gain of delta, okay? The find the size of delta, the minimum possible size of delta, such that your system goes unstable. So, rephrasing this, the, maximum, the structured singular value is a measure of what is the smallest possible perturbation you can put in the system before it goes unstable. Not too bad after all, right? And the measure is the inverse of the size of the delta function. But why is it useful? Because we are now considering the structure of the delta function through its size, through its maximum singular value. So how do you find it? It becomes even more interesting now. So the way you find this mu is that uh, first you find the, the first you are given a structure of delta okay you make some assumptions and you say what is the smallest possible delta small in terms of the maximum singular value such that the system goes unstable find that delta calculate the structure the maximum st uh, singular value and then the structured singular value is just the inverse of that we'll do a few examples but <laughs> Ah, by the way, if for any reason, just because m is made that way, the determinant of i minus m delta never goes to zero, then the structured singular value is defined as zero. Okay, if the system never goes unstable, whatever perturbation you throw at it, the structured singular value is defined to be zero. Okay, so we will look at some little bit more intuition later. Are there any questions on this? It's important to understand the concept. Maybe, maybe the concept is going to be clearer like this. So, I'll repeat it once again. The structured singular value represents uh, a measure of what is the minimum perturbation you can throw in the system before things go, un go, go unstable. You have heard this concept already in Control Systems 1. Does anybody dare to say where, where they have seen this? When we were looking at, when you were looking at uh, stability, no? And you were introduced to Bode diagrams. Now you say, okay, you've got this thing and uh, and you calculated the two numbers that, uh, that uh, quantified stability in some sense. You called them the margins of, the, of stability, or the gain margin and the phase margin. And, and, and if you, I don't know if you've ever, I mean, I'm sure you have. Um, if uh, you, let's say you have a Nyquist plot of some function, okay, like this, and this is the critical point minus one, okay? And you saw maybe, that the gain margin was, uh, so if, if, this, if this is your L, which is basically C times uh, P I'm in a single input, single output system, and let's say there is, I, I, C is defined such, I, I, I put a K in front of it, just a scalar that we can play around with. The more you are, um, the more you increase K, the more this, uh, this, this loop gets a little bit bigger, 
a little bit bigger as, as, as k increases, right? At some point, it gets to the critical point here, right? And when it gets to the critical point, the system goes unstable. And it turned out that the k critical, that is the maximum gain you could multiply your system as such before it went unstable, you know what I mean? It's like exactly the definition of the structured singular value, is, uh, uh, what, what, is what you called the gain margin. So you can imagine the structured singular value, which is the same concept, is what is the minimum gain, not the minimum gain, but the minimum perturbation, you can, size of the perturbation you can put in the system before things go unstable. You can imagine the structured singular value as if it was the inverse of a, of a, of a, of a stability margin, basically, for robustness. So what's, uh, what's the, the, the point here? Um, it, it has been introduced to to account for the structure of, of delta. So uh, what we introduce, when we introduce something new, of course it's not that whatever was existed before doesn't even, it's not right anymore, right? It's like we're adding some more information. So particular cases of this, uh, of this definition intuitively should match the, the things we know already. For example, we said that the previous problem um, was very, the, 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 the conditions we found applying the unstructured small gain theorem to the M delta function gave very um, conservative conditions in terms of the infinity norm of the M transfer matrix. And we said we didn't consider a structure of delta in deriving that condition. Well, it's maybe intuitive that if delta has no structure. No structure means it has, it can be an arbitrarily full matrix. It's, you can just put elements wherever you want. Then uh, mu will be exactly equal to the uh, structured singular, or to the maximum singular value of M. That it, but we'll see it later in math wise. But what I want to say here is if you study the limit cases of a very unstructured delta, then you'll just, you'll just get exactly what you had before. If instead you start inserting structure in the delta matrix, for example, you make it diagonal, for example, you make it diagonal, and all the terms on the diagonals are all the same. So the more structure you put inside your, uh, inside your delta, the more the, the structured singular value will tend towards the other end of the spectrum, which is the spectral radius, that is the maximum eigenvalue of a system. But we'll see it later. So once we have this... Uh, structure the singular value as a measure of, of, of the gain of the system before it goes unstable. We can apply the small gain theorem to it, and uh, what happens is that the condition, it's, it's very similar uh, to what happens before. Before we said that um, uh, an M-delta structure is robustly stable if and only if the infinity norm of M was less than 1. If you remember, what's the infinity norm of something? It's again the soup over omega of uh, the maximum uh, uh, singular value of M. And we said this had to be smaller than one. This is, was the previous theorem, okay? And here, basically, I hope I do not have to convince you too much in saying that the same thing applies, but you, instead of considering the structured singular, the singular value, you consider the structured singular value. So this is the small gain theorem just reformulated with this new measure of the structured singular value. And, um, so the proof is, uh, it comes directly from the definition. And uh, what it says is that if a mu is smaller than one for all frequencies, um, then uh, what you need to have is that in order the minimum required perturbation to destabilize the system must be bigger than one, which uh, um, breaks the hypothesis because of course we're still assuming that our delta has a size that is less than one. So anyways, the takeaway from this slide, which is a little messy, is that uh, uh, mu is a measure of what is the smallest possible perturbation you can put in the system before it blows up. And it's a measure that accounts this time for the structure of the perturbation. It's not just like a, a, a very gross, um, a very coarse uh, description. So some properties of singular values. Uh, first of all, a structured singular value is always non-negative. It's always positive or equal to zero, right? Why? Well, a structured singular value is, a, uh, is the smallest possible singular value, right? It's, it's, so it's a singular value, basically. And a singular value is defined as, uh, as uh, the root of, uh, what is it, the lambda of a singular value of a certain matrix. 
is uh, a transpose. So this has to be positive by definition, right? So there is little to say. Then this, uh, we will not go into details, but I recommend you actually go and check the proofs in the, in the book, in the textbook. We have references in the next, uh, um, at the usual place. If delta, if the perturbation that is introduced, the uncertainty that is introduced has no structure, that is, it's a full matrix, it's a complex, arbitrarily full matrix, then the structured singular value is equal to the maximum singular value. It's exactly what we had before. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, if there is the maximum structure you can put, you remove all the possible degrees of freedom from the, from the parameterization of the delta. That is, you say your delta matrix is going to be a diagonal matrix uh, with only terms of the diagonal that are the same. Then uh, the singular value is going to be equal to the uh, spectral radius. That is, the spectral radius is the, 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 the maximum singular value of a matrix. Then it's, uh, uh, it's possible to show that uh, uh, um, if you have a diagonal um, delta, the diagonal family of perturbations, then uh, the structured singular value is going to be always bounded underneath and above by the two conditions before, by the condition of perfect structure and to the condition of no structure. So the structured singular value is always bounded by the maximum singular value and the spectral radius of a function. No, sorry, not always, but if the, uh, uh, if the delta is diagonal. And the last step, which is interesting, is that um, the structured singular value, so st it, it, this is a measure of stability. You know, what's the smallest possible uh, size of the perturbation before the system goes unstable? And stability doesn't care about scaling. If you multiply and divide by quantities, something that was stable still stays stable. Okay, if something is convergent, you multiply it by a big number, still is convergent. It just has different values, but stability is always there. So if you uh, multiply by, uh, if you look at these, this diagram here on the right, if you multiply by the inverse and D, the delta matrix, and then you just multiply by the inverse matrices so that nothing changes, we can actually uh, say that the structured singular value of a matrix is always equal to the structured singular value of this uh, scaled matrix, okay? Where these are some diagonal terms that commute with delta. So the fundamental idea behind this property is that stability doesn't change with scaling. So you can scale the M function as you want. And still you maintain the same, the same properties of stability. And since mu measures properties of stability, you get the same result. So if you put together the last two properties, uh, what you get is, so of course, we could apply this to the lower bound and to the upper bound, but we just focus on the upper bound because it's more, more interesting to us because our conditions to say that uh, the structured singular value has to be smaller than some number. So if we know the upper bound of, of the structured singular value, it's easier for us to, to, to verify the robust performance conditions. It turns out that uh, we can express the structured singular value as we can bound the structured singular value with the maximum eigenvalue of the scaled matrix. Okay, so you can bound. Bound is, is, is gives some information, but really not much information if you don't know how good the bound is. And, uh, and here comes the fun part. So the fun part is that uh, uh, the, the determining the bounds, the lower and the upper bounds of mu is a mess in the sense that uh, it's an active area of research. There's uh, uh, many different cases. Uh, there, is, there exists no analytical solution to finding mu. Okay, you cannot, uh, I can't give you an equation that says, hey, in any case, mu is equal to blah, blah, blah. It doesn't exist, okay? You have to evaluate it on a case-by-case on -case basis. Actually, finding the exact value is sometimes simply not possible. So what uh, exists are methods, iterative methods, numerical methods, that allow to iteratively uh, uh, make the upper and lower bounds the smaller and smaller, the more information you're given. We're not going to get into any of that because it's beyond the scope of the, of the course. Uh, what I wanted to communicate to you here is say that, uh, look, when you study robustness problems and you use the H-infinity approach, you're, you, you're studying the worst case scenario. If you need something a little bit more, more, more insightful than the worst case scenario, there exists. Uh, 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 that's something. It's called structured singular value. If you ever need it in your professional life, open a book, go find it, find some cases that have been, uh, that match your practical situation and study exactly how, how, how the, it, it could be calculated for your specific case. But without going into proofs, 
it turns out that if the size of the, of, the, uh, of the delta matrix is less than three, then this bound is tight. Tight means that it's an equality holds. And if it's instead bigger, you have more blocks of uncertainty, then uh, there's, there's, the tights are less, are less good. So just to some quick recap of the properties. Structured singular values are a function of delta, okay? This is the biggest, um, the biggest difference between the structured singular values and the singular values, the normal singular values. Why it's a function of delta? Well, we introduced it just on purpose to, to, to evaluate the structure of delta, so it's kind of obvious. Um, we can use the structured singular value to generalize the robustness of the small gain theorem applied to the M-delta structure. Um, we didn't show this, but it's intuitive. The idea is that uh, here we always, we always when, 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 thanks to the introduction of the weighting functions, we always say that uh, the infinity norm of delta has to be smaller or equal to one. So when you just consider this assumption, you get exactly the condition we introduced before in the theorem. That is this condition here. Um, structured singular values provide necessary and sufficient conditions for robust stability and of course robust performance when we recast the, the problem in, in a robust stability one. Once you're given mu, okay? Because if you're given mu, you can apply this, this, this uh, condition you've seen before and you can tell in a much better way if in a much less, cons in a less conservative way uh, how, how your system is stable or not. So the tricky part is that is finding mu. Uh, in general, there is no closed form solution. So there is no equation to represent mu. There are instead, as I mentioned before, numerical approaches that can iteratively refine the bounds. Okay, but, uh, but we're not gonna get, of course, into them. So the question that is legitimate is how tight are these bounds? Well. The bounds uh, are tight when the blocks of uncertainty are less than three. So when you have two blocks of uncertainty, you, uh, you can put an equality here. Okay, so let's look at a few examples. So here there are two uh, examples I would like to make. First, I want to show you how the bounds for structured singular values are bad. And to do so, we take two cases. Um, so remember that we said that, um, what did we say? That the structured singular value of some function of, of M is always, uh, when delta is diagonal, is bounded by the maximum singular value of M and what? And the spectral radius of M, okay? So, so let's evaluate these things, no? So what is the, what is the, um, let's start from the spectral radius of M. The spectral radius of M is the maximum uh, eigenvalue of M. And uh, it should be obvious that the maximum eigenvalue of M is zero in this case, right? Right. Then, um, in this case, it's even easy to see that we have done actually an example uh, exactly like this when we talked about uh, uh, singular values, that the maximum singular value of this M function is beta, it's the maximum gain in some direction. Of course, beta is the only thing that's in the, in the, in the, in the, in the matrix, so there must be a direction such that that beta is, is the gain in that direction. So how do you find U of M, mu of M in this case? But remember, U of M is what? It's the minimum possible uh, size, measured somehow, of a delta that sends the system unstable. So it's a constrained optimization problem. You want the minimum of something subject to some constraints, okay? So there are, have, have you ever seen constrained optimization problems at this point in your career? Lagrangian approach, stuff like this, never heard? Okay. So the idea is that, uh, that first of all, let's satisfy the constraint, okay? So because it, mu is only defined when that constraint is defined. So to find the mu of m, let's first look at the determinant of what was it? I minus m delta or delta m? Let's double check. It was uh, I minus m delta. Determinant of I minus M delta. Okay, so how do we get this done? Well, we first calculate what M delta is, and M delta is equal to M times delta. So zero beta, this is zero, this is definitely zeros, and up there we have a beta delta two. No? Yes, maybe? 
So I'll use this to avoid making mistakes. Um, so what? So the determinant of i minus m delta is uh, i minus the determinant of i minus this thing here. And this turns out to be what? This turns out to be, um, well, let's just, it turns out to be the determinant of what? Of uh, 1 minus uh, 0, so 1, 1 minus beta delta 2, 0. And this is equal to what? Is equal to this time times minus this time times is this to uh, 1, sorry. So uh, what's the point here? What is the smallest delta such that this determinant goes to 0? There is no delta, okay? So this means that you can throw whatever in the perturbation you want in this case, uh, but the system will never go unstable. So if we recall the definition of mu, when delta is always different from 0, mu is defined as 0, okay? What does this tell us? This tells us that, uh, look at the bounds. Mu of m is now bounded, is equal to zero, and it was upper bounded by beta. So a beta was a positive number, which could be arbitrarily large. So if you were using just uh, the condition of the H infinity norm, a condition that we introduced with a small gain theorem, forgetting about the structured singular value, you would have that your uh, maximum gain of the system has to be uh, smaller than some big number, some, M, some positive number, okay? Well, it's not true. Actually, if you have a delta, if you consider the structure of your uncertainty, it turns out that, that, that the upper bound is, is infinitely bad because it actually had to be, the condition was, was, was zero. If we do the uh, same exercise for this other case, uh, we get uh, a, a bad the lower bound in the sense that uh, you will see that I, I'll avoid doing it because I want to spend some time on the next one because it's a little bit more interesting. You will get that uh, it, uh, this is an example of bad lower bound. That is that the structure, the, the structured singular value is actually equal to the sigma m. This is, um, you can do it at home. So now let's take a little bit more of a, of a, of a complete example. I don't have much time, so I will sketch through it, but, um, but try to follow and please ask your questions if things aren't clear. So what are we studying? We're studying exactly the same block diagram that we showed the first slide of this module. We said this whole hour is going to be around that problem. So we're studying the problem of rob robust performance, trying to minimize the effect of noise on the output. So we take the M function that we, the M transfer matrix that we found before, that we derived, and we make some simplifying assumption because it's a CISO problem. So one of the weights uh, is equal to one, and of course there's no need anymore to distinguish between output and input sensitivity functions, and they're all just sensitivity functions. Comments, questions, or doubts? No? Yes? Maybe? M is equal to this stuff here, okay? So this is just applying the assumptions we're making. Now. What's the size of M? Two, it's less than three. So we know that the bounds on the scaled version of the structured singular values are tight. What does this mean? It means that if we introduce a diagonal scaling matrix, D, and we just define the, the ratio of the scaling parameters as some number, then uh, uh, we uh, can express the structured singular value as uh, the structured singular value of the scaled M, okay? Let's call this, uh, this uh, uh, scaled M an A matrix. And that is, of course, a function of alpha because D, where alpha is the ratio of the two terms in D. We know that um, this is equal to the, for a property that we showed before, this is equal to the inf of the maximum singular value of uh, the scaled M. So we can find the, the structured singular value by applying this, by finding this term here. So what is this term here? It's the square root of the maximum eigenvalue of, the, uh, of A transpose A. Why? That's, that, that's the definition. This is actually uh, the um, uh, inf of uh, the sigma of M, right? The sigma of M is equal to the square root of the maximum value of what? Of the um, M star M. This is the definition of singular value. It's what we've seen a few classes ago. Once we find the, the structured singular value, then we know that the system will be robustly performant if uh, 
for every possible frequency, the structure singular value is less than one, which is the sufficient and necessary condition we've, we derived from the uh, small gain theorem. So what are the steps? We have to find this guy here, okay? So the first step is, of course, uh, finding uh, uh, A. So A is equal to D inverse MD. Um, this turns out to be what? It turns out to be um, minus W2 times T minus alpha W2 T W N 1 over alpha times the sensitivity function and S times W N. Okay? So, and this is simply by calculating the inverse of D and doing the multiplication. It's trivial algebra. Now, we need to find the, uh, the maximum eigenvalue of A transpose A. So, time is short, actually finished, so I'll have to skim through this. Um, remember that the Hermitian transpose, uh, A star, is the Hermitian transpose. So, you have to do the transpose and the complex conjugate. These are all transfer functions, so they are complex uh, rational functions. So, with the bar, we represent the complex conjugate. So, feel free to go if you want. Um, I would like to take a few minutes that, we, that you took at the break so I can finish doing this because I think it's going to be useful. Um, so anyways, let's just go through it quickly. The A star is represented by this. What you do next, you, you calculate the eigenvalue of it. Well, the, now you just got a matrix. You know how to calculate eigenvalues of matrices. You do lambda I minus the matrix and you find the, the determinant and you put it equal to zero. And it turns out that the maximum eigenvalue will have this representation. Now we need to find the, now that we have the maximum eigenvalue, of course, these are eigenvalues, there are different eigenvalues. We want to find the, the uh, scaling such that you get the smallest possible perturbation, the smallest possible delta, right? So we want to find the, what is the alpha that minimizes the lambda max, because the structured singular value goes and measure the smallest possible perturbation that sends your system unstable. And if you just take the derivative of this with respect to alpha and put it equal to zero, as if you were finding the minimum and maximum of a regular function, you get an expression of alpha min. You plug it back, in, back inside, now you have the smallest possible maximum Megan value, which is uh, represented by this, uh, uh, the sum of these two functions. So if you then uh, just implement the robust performance condition, um, you'll see that this has to hold for every omega. So whatever, we didn't have the time to go through this in detail, but the graphical representation, back to square one. When we saw robust uh, stability, we saw, look, the uncertainty represented by this circle doesn't have to intersect to the critical point. Well, robust performance is the same thing. But instead of having one circle, now you have two circles, one on the loop gain function and one on the critical point as well. So, of course, the conditions are a little bit more tricky. The, and, and what the condition that we derived here shows is simply that these two circles never need to intersect in order to guarantee robust performance. Just to answer the question that we said at the beginning, is, is robust performance just the sum of nominal performance and robust ability? No, because if you look at uh, the two conditions, this is for a CISO system, huh? if you look at the two conditions for robust stability and performance and you just sum them up together, you get, yes, you get the robust performance condition, but you get it satisfied for less than two. We need it for less than one. So, no, in general, the sum of the two doesn't guarantee robust performance, but it's not too bad after all anyways, okay? So if you, <laughs> if you respect the robust stability and nominal performance criteria very well, then you guarantee nominal, st nominal stability as well. So just to say, sorry for going over, thank you for staying, but in the next classes, we'll continue with actually, uh, uh, we'll switch to synthesis approaches. We'll start designing controllers and not just analyzing stuff.